So first I would like to say thank you to Alieu because sharing his story is really important. Uh, I will tell a story from a slightly different perspective, the perspective of uh, receiving municipalities. I'll tell a tale of two cities in uh, Sweden and Denmark. And uh, the tale is based on a project uh, financed by the Swedish Research Council. And uh, the project was called The Welfare States and its Newcomers. And the question is, where are recently arrived refugees and relatives going to live? Should they have the possibility to choose a place of living for themselves? Or should there be a national regulatory standard for the distribution of refugees throughout the national territory? Should the newcomers, regardless of regulatory standards on a national level, be able to choose where they wish to live in the host municipalities? Or should the municipalities have the option of housing newcomers in specific residential areas and even to prevent them from residing in certain neighborhoods? In each and every country that admits refugees, asylum seekers and the next of kin, these are questions calling for an answer. The way different countries have chosen to deal with these questions, as well as justifications given and consequences thereof, vary quite markedly, even when we are talking about countries that historically have had much in common concerning other welfare policy choices. Welfare policy choices. I, I will try to do that. Um, there will be coffee after, after my uh, presentation, <laughs> so I try to rush through it. But I will tell you that this variation is interesting, both because of the real consequences of the, respect, of the respective policies and as an illustration of the underlying tensions that, that emerge when Western welfare states seek to manage their moral obligation towards vulnerable and oppressed human beings, but also their need for foreign labor and the challenges arising in social, social the rising arise and the challenges of rising social and ethnic diversity. Swedish policies with respect to the housing of newcomers have, since the implementation of the so-called EBO legislation in 1994, given asylum seekers the opportunity to decide for themselves where they want to settle. About 50% of all newly arrived refugees and asylum seekers since 1994 have chosen this option, while the rest have chosen to settle in so-called accommodation centers, ABO, run by the Swedish Migration Board. A small number of municipalities like Södertälje, Malmö, Botkyrka and Gothenburg and a few others have thus had to accept a very large number of newcomers, while other municipalities, often affluent suburban ones, have hardly taken on any newcomers at all. This has led to dissatisfaction among certain municipal officials who argue that the burden of reception, as it is called, is unfairly distributed. A municipality which has clearly positioned itself as an opponent of EBO legislation is Malmö. For example, in 2004, the mayor of Malmö, Ilmar Epalo, wrote a letter to the then Social Democratic Minister of Integration, Mona Salin, demanding a five-year moratorium, a break simply, on any further flow of unemployed immigrants, including newcomers, to Malmö. Salin answered that she understood Malmö's position but that everyone that has been allowed to live in Sweden should have equal rights and responsibilities, including the right to choose where to live. Interestingly, Salin changed her mind quite radically in 2008 when she had become party leader of the Social Democratic Party. However, her party was then in opposition and the new right-wing coalition government repudiated all proposals that would restrict the freedom of choice both in regard to the right of municipalities to decide on how many refugees would be received and the right of refugees to determine where to live. Recapitulating, it can be affirmed that during the last few years, the issue of accommodation of newcomers has been high on the Swedish political agenda, both nationally and locally. The political development in Denmark during the last decade has created an interesting point of comparison to the Swedish case. Ever since the adoption of the Integration Act in 1999, a strict distribution system for newcomers has been in place, based on a formula that takes account of the number of people with foreign origin residing in, in the municipalities. Those municipalities that already have a high percentage of individuals with foreign origin have taken in few, if any, newcomers. Whereas municipalities with low percentages have got to admit a larger number. When a newly arrived refugee has been settled in a municipality, 
he or she, by stipulation of the Integration Act, is legally expected to remain in the assigned municipality during the entire introduction period, lasting three years, unless a relocation is justified by a job offer elsewhere or the newcomer is accepted by another target municipality. If the newcomer, in spite of the said legal stipulations, goes ahead and moves to another municipality, he or she loses the state financial compensation. The intention behind the Danish refugee settlement policy is to create an equal distribution of the number of newcomers across all municipalities so that more, handles can, more hands can handle a task, as it is ex as expressed, and integration thus be encouraged. There is also an explicit understanding that a dispersion of newcomers will come about not only between but also within municipalities. The fundamental tension between, on the one hand, the autonomy of, of the individual and on the other, the interest of the community, has in other words been handled totally different in Denmark than in Sweden. Interestingly, the tangible hardening of Danish integration policies that we have observed during the last decade originates as far back as the early 1990s, when the social democratic mayors of West Copenhagen and Aarhus protested against what they saw as, unfair, as an unfair distribution of costs associated with national immigration policies. As opposed to Sweden, where local government officials have unsuccessfully criticized immigration policies in the national arena for two decades, Danish mayors were from early on supported by leading politicians in Folketinget. The links between the national and local political level have thus produced very different results on this issue in the two neighboring countries. Then why study Malmö and orders? Well, one crucial reason is that the two cities resemble each other in a number of relevant ways. Both are old harbors and industrial cities with a population today hovering around 300,000 inhabitants. Both cities are also regional centers, but still being much smaller than the respective capitals, Stockholm and Copenhagen. The geographical arrangement is also highly similar, with old, compact downtowns by the sea, surrounded by semicircle of settlements at some distance from the city center. Everything is more or less within walking distance. But that has not in any way prevented the rise of substantial socioeconomic and of late ethnic segregation. In fact, an important similarity between the two cities is that Malmö's Rosengård and Åhus Gellerup Parken for decades have been right at the center of each country's national debate on integration and diversity. Naturally, there are also contrasts between the two cities. Aarhus is a significant center of research and education. Malmö is struggling to become one. In comparison to Aarhus, Malmö also has a housing issue characterized by shortages and inefficient moving chains. With respect to the reception and, and introduction of newcomers, however, the difference between the city can mainly be derived from the respective national migration and refugee settlement policies. First of all, changes in Danish migration policies have led Denmark to accept far fewer refugees and asylum seekers in Sweden throughout the last decade, in absolute numbers as well as share of total inhabitants. Secondly, and as mentioned earlier, the Danish Integration Act has meant that in Denmark it is the state that has absolute control over refugee settlement policies, whereas the Swedish state has got rid of its power to control newcomers' housing patterns. The changes in Danish policies in both of these areas have resulted in a situation where the municipality of Aarhus has admitted only a few dozen newcomers yearly during the past few years. In contrast, the municipality of Malmö has received, when at its highest, about 3,000 newcomers per year. What does this difference in numbers mean in terms of newcomers' introduction processes? And what's the impact on the municipality's ability to manage challenges such as housing shortages and residential, and residential segregation? These are the two main questions that I have posed in my interviews with civil servants in Malmö and Aarhus. In Malmö, two factors are stressed as particularly important by the civil servants in terms of the introduction process. These are housing and the newcomer's psychic health. As one uh, person put it, had we been able to manage psychic illness and housing, it would have made it easier, I think, to learn the language and thereby to integrate. In another interview, I asked, will Malmö catch up? No, it will not happen. Not with the existing housing situation. If that, if that doesn't work, a whole lot else doesn't work either. 
Now, I don't mean everything would be milk and honey if everyone had a place to live, but it would definitely make things easier. In many ways, it is a problem, particularly when combined with post-traumatic syndrome. Primary needs must be met before you can learn new things. If you don't have a place to live, you can't study. So, of course, it is an issue. And even if you're hardened as an officer, it feels awful to get to know that a family is out in the street with three children and nowhere to go. How can these factors be confronted? With respect to psychic illness, Malmö started an introduction educational package geared specifically towards newcomers undergoing psychiatric treatment due to migration-related complications. In terms of housing, however, there's a widespread impression that Malmö cannot manage this issue locally and that changes in national settlement policies are necessary in order to give Malmö some breathing space. A person working uh, in Rosengård told me this. If some breathing space had been given to Rosengård for a few years, I think a lot could have been improved. The unceasing inflow on newcomers makes it very trying. EBO asks a lot of Malmö. Even if I'm in favor of people having the right to decide where to live, it takes a lot of effort. There are consequences for the families and above all for the children. Finally, one of the civil servants told me, well, of course they go for EBO. It's a thoroughly human choice. I think that everyone understands how they think. The problem is that when they find themselves in Malmö, there are no flats and not a whole lot of help available. When I've asked the same questions in orders, the answers have centered more on problems in the past and problems that, might, that may arise in the future. There seems to be a consensus, at least among civil servants and orders, that conditions at present are good and that the situation, from the perspective of the municipality, is under control. I asked the teacher at Danish for newcomers, you got 20 years of experience in teaching Danish for newcomers. If you were to go back and ponder over your own experiences, has it changed? And he, had, and he told me, it has changed a lot. An absolute turnabout. 20 years ago, langu language classes and the fight against unemployment were two sides of the same coin. We taught, by and large, unemployed people, about 95% of the participants. We focused on jobs and nothing else. It was the essential. That is not the case today, as 95% of our students have jobs. Another servant said, if the target group consists of newcomers from countries of war, it doesn't really matter how hard we try and how good the labor market is. In spite of things being, well, felt as under control in order, some worries cloud the sky even there. I asked in some of the interviews a question like this, what is paradoxical for me when arriving in orders is, on one hand, the picture or feeling which I have come across here, that things are working well in terms of refugee reception. On the other hand, there is this Danish debate about ghettos and failed integration, which I find both uncompromising and high in the agenda. How can you make sense of this? One interview person said, well, you know, that is complex and a bit peculiar. I'm generalizing now, but some of those living in ghettos, say Gellerup, are people who have lived in Denmark for nearly 20 years. They have most likely been instructed in Danish, but have not been part of a more planned integration process. Old habits die hard. But I argue that through the work we do now, we shall not have such a large group of these people in Gellerup. But another servant said also something interesting. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we gave them cash and so parked them up. Some did not wish to learn Danish, and we made few demands. But you know, we had a meeting in the sports arena Globus One in Gellerup. And then a little boy said, see, I made a Danish harrier today. He said it in Oreo's dialect, but he does not think of himself as Danish. It is the others who are Danish. Taken as a whole, it is clear that the policy divergence at the national level has led to far-reaching consequences at the, municipal, at the municipal level. Whereas Malmö accepts thousands of newly arrived refugees and immigrants every year, orders receive about 20. Where newcomers to Malmö come from countries such as Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, and Syria, 
Immigration to Aarhus is mainly labor migration from other EU countries. In Malmö, you are struck by a feeling of crisis in the reception of refugees. While in Aarhus, the feeling is that everything is under control, not least since public officials rem remember how it was before, during the 1990s, when the situation in Aarhus was much more like the situation in Malmö today. The question is, if this means that the prerequisites for a successful refugee reception in Malmö would be fulfilled if Swedish refugee settlement policies would go back to the type of distribution philosophy that was tested during the so-called All of Sweden strategy, 1985 to 1994, or perhaps to a Danish model with a nationally determined re redistribution standard based on the share of immigrants in different municipalities. And would the breathing space in the reception of refugees help Malmö to deal with issues of residential segregation, unemployment, poverty, and crime? Judging from experiences in Aarhus, the answer is yes with regard to the organization of refugee reception and introduction, but no, in the short run at least, with regard to residential segregation and the problems that follow in its wake. The regulation of Danish refugee settlement policies, together with the toughening of migration policies in the last decade, have resulted in a very small number of direct arrivals being settled. The few newcomers who go directly to orders get a well-organized reception with housing, language lessons, and an internship already set up, often on the date of arrival. On the other hand, orders has not come any further than Malmö in terms of managing social and ethnic segregation in spite of a housing market which hardly seems to be, as in Malmö, under severe pressure. Swedish migration policy, in a European perspective, is characterized by principles that are both more generous, and more generous than most and more open to annual variations in reception. This variation would be difficult to handle within an approach like Denmark's, which focuses on publicly regulated refugee settlement policies. Given EBO legislation, the Swedish government can play the accordion, so to speak, making it possible to manage comparatively large shifts in the number of newcomers from one year to the next. As such, this policy harmonizes with the open philosophy that continues to impact Swedish migration and integration policies. To the extent that these policies are carried out at municipal expense, economically and organizationally, we may, however, ask whether this is truly a reasonable state of affairs. It is my impression, when looking at Danish refugee settlement policies, that no pressure for fundamental change is exerted by the municipalities, nor by any of the political blocs in the Folketinget. During the th 2011 election, the immigrant question was for the first time in this century outshined by other political issues, especially the issue of national redistribution policies. And it is too early to speculate on the consequences this can have on political developments in this field. It strikes me, however, as improbable that Denmark will in the foreseeable future move closer to Sweden in the field of migration, refugee settlement, and integration policies. A more credible scenario would be Sweden moving closer to Denmark. But despite the protests from refugee receiving municipalities, it is not likely that what changes first will be refugee settlement policy. My guess is that up until the next election, we will see issues connected to immigration and integration become even more preponderant than they have been of late. But we will probably not see any dramatic political changes before the election. During this period, Malmö will carry on receiving more newcomers and their relatives than it can manage. While Aarhus stays the course, trying to create a coherent city with and for the population already in place. Now, the obvious concluding question is, of course, which system is the best? The Danish, characterized by a strongly regulated settlement policy within a framework of an utterly restrictive migration policy and with an integration policy that in all simplicity can be summarized by the words work and adaptation. Or the Swedish, featuring a refugee settlement policy that makes it possible for newcomers to pick their place of residence anywhere in the country immediately after arrival within the framework of a migration policy that could be termed restrictive in an objective sense, but that in comparison to the rest of Europe must be regarded as one of the most generous. And with an integration policy in which employment orientation has received more and more attention, but then nonetheless also leaves room for equal rights and responsibilities 
as a political ob objective, and at least some pluralism in terms of language and values. From a scientific point of view, there is no simple answer to this question, since it depends on what we consider most important and also on what time perspective we are talking about. As I see it, the differences between Swedish and Danish migration and integration policies, all the more noticeable this last decade, represent two contrasting points of view on how small and relatively affluent welfare states should and can handle the challenges of globalization. We cannot know at present how our societies will be, be affected in the future by the choices we are making today. It is thus not possible to say that the Danish model is better or worse than the Swedish in the long run. Although all of us certainly have our own philosophical, ideological and political ideas. But that is something else. That said, we should of course continue to pay attention to these issues and learn as we go from the experiences we make on both sides of Öresund. Thank you.